Hello, glad you could join us. On this episode, we've got cybersecurity awareness and readiness, plus implementing automation and AI in real-time assurance. Stay tuned. Hello and welcome. Let's start with some updates. Your clothes may be fashionable, but are they ethical? Popular clothing manufacturer Sheen is launching a social media campaign to give people an inside look at the company's efforts around labor, sustainability, and product safety after being accused of greenwashing and violating labor laws, even copyright theft. All this may not matter to fans of the fast fashion brand flaunting their sheen hauls on Instagram, but it may matter to investors as the company moves ahead with plans to go public in 2024. Recent job postings by the company for internal controls, internal audit staff may suggest a sincere effort in a positive direction. October is Cybersecurity Awareness Month in the U.S., and since 2004, it has been an annual opportunity to amplify the need for continued vigilance and proactive defense of the systems, software, and online activities that connect us to the world. For most internal auditors and their organizations, cybersecurity is always top of mind and requires, as our guest today puts it, a resilient culture to support its implementation. Here's the IIA's Robert Perez speaking to Michael Eccles, CEO of Max Cybersecurity LLC, to share more. Michael, thank you for joining me so much. Hey, thanks for having me. You, you just wrapped up uh, your uh, conversation at GRC on building a resilient culture. Mm -hmm. Tell me a little bit, what is, what is building a resilient culture referred to in this instance? Well, one of the things that I try to help organizations realize is that when they're looking at the news every night, and they're seeing these nation states carry out cyber exploits, and it's going over their head, it doesn't really appear to connect with them um, that those times have changed, and that they now can become the victim of the same type of exploits that are carried out by 14 year olds that are right on their block. And so just uh, having a cyber secure system in place isn't enough to protect them because as we've seen from prior incidents, almost every system can be uh, overcome. And so it's the ability to stand back up when something occurs. It's the ability to move uh, from one system or as they say, to a backup system when necessary. And this obviously requires a lot of pre-planning and thinking and a sort of a co cogent strategy as, as you move forward. Where does that start? Does it start with the board? Does it start with the, the CEO? So one of the, the really big issues that I'm trying to walk people back on is we started with technology and mm -hmm. we started with the strategies back in maybe five or six years ago um, where we would implement a security strategy based on a technology that was available mm -hmm. to us. The new thinking is that we need to understand uh, what's important to our organization, and it's gonna be different for each organization. So it starts with understanding your priorities, um, what your security strategy is going to be. We then look at our critical systems and services, and then we look at the dependencies for those critical systems and services and products. After we've done all of that, then we can figure out what our security strategy should be. I mean, and obviously that is quite high level stuff, but I mean, mm -hmm. ultimately, and, and you're talking about building a culture, ultimately it, it has to filter all the way down to the folks who do the work on a daily basis, who may be working uh, and may not understand the vulnerabilities, for example, that, that their actions are creating. Tell me a little bit about how that filters down eventually to the line worker. So I got that lesson, I first got that lesson 40 years ago. I was working in loss prevention. And some wise gentleman told me that there's only two people in this retail establishment that can make a $5 million decision. That's the CEO and the loss prevention person that stops somebody that they should not have stopped. And they get sued. And so taking that same philosophy, when it comes to these digital sciences, 
Um, the CEO makes these giant decisions. The risk management guy puts these processes in place, but the users have the ability to undermine everything that has been put in place and not always in a malicious way. Hmm. In most cases, it's just an error or a mistake. So it's incumbent upon a leader to ensure that mechanisms are in place so those mistakes don't occur and that those individuals that you're depending on are doing the right thing even when you're not watching them. I mean, that is such a, a critical message, especially as cybersecurity becomes more complex, more sophisticated, uh, and cyber criminals become more complex and more sophisticated. How hard is it to get that message through to those stakeholders, those decision makers, uh, and get them to understand? You need, to, impl you need to, to put in place this kind of culture in your organization. So the language has to change. So the first part of the language that changes is we have to move from this language of cybersecurity. For some reason, a lot of leaders have equated that to IT. Mm -hmm. They call it IT security. In reality, what we're doing is risk management, right? We're trying to understand all the vulnerabilities in the environment. We're trying to understand all the threats, and we're trying to understand those threats that can exercise the vulnerabilities, and then the consequences that are gonna occur. Does that really affect us? Is it something that we can transfer um, in terms of risk? Can we avoid that risk? Can we live with it if something happens? Mm -hmm. And so once you change that language, all of a sudden, the technical people and the leadership are speaking the same language, right? Because we're talking about risk. We all understand risks. Uh, organizational leaders have been dealing with financial risk for many, many, many years, right? And so that risk modeling that we're doing, now that we've moved away from cybersecurity and we're looking at risk, should be directly tied to what are the goals and objectives and priorities for the company? So now all of a sudden, you're having a direct conversation between the governance, risk, and compliance people mm -hmm. and the leadership, the board. And it's easier to get that risk management spread across the organization so everybody understands what, what they're doing. Sure. Um, it's one thing for me as the GRC person to try to get individuals in various departments who already have bosses and supervisors to take certain actions. It's much different when the CEO of the organization is telling everybody that this is what we're gonna do as an organization. And that's probably the biggest issue that a governance risk and compliance person has is they can't get that buy-in from leadership. They get the buy-in on paper, right? They accept the reporting that comes from the GRC person, but they don't buy in where they're willing to make the statement to the body, uh, the organization, so that they're all in line with the GRC strategies. So if there's one step, either one best practice or one action that you can take or one mandate that you can make as a, as a top level manager or board to start building that resilient culture, what is that? Mm -hmm. I would say that is to determine what your critical services are, critical products and services. Just doing that exercise, all of a sudden you're gonna understand what your dependencies and interdependencies for each of those critical products and services. And you're gonna quickly understand who is associated with each. Because there may be a junior level employee who is in a very key position for you being resilient, mm -hmm. and you never knew it. Because he's the only one that knows the door lock number, <laughs> right? He's yeah. the only one that can get in that closet. And by walking through, starting with the critical services and products and their interdependencies, you've now created a roadmap for yourself that you now just have to fill in. So it's not rocket science. Sometimes not it's a simple science. solution. That's right. It's just okay. a company politics. Michael, thank you so much for joining me today. We've had a fascinating conversation. Thank you. Yes, sir. The IIA is presenting the Cybersecurity Virtual Conference on October 27th 
This is an opportunity to explore cybersecurity risks and opportunities for internal audit to provide valuable assurance and insight. Here's a sample of what you'll learn as Robert Perez chats with conference presenter Grant Osler. Hi, I'm here with Grant Osler, who's going to be presenting at the 2022 Cybersecurity Virtual Conference on October 27th. Grant, thank you so much for joining me. And yeah, I'm really excited to have a chance to talk about internal audit and how we can have a bigger impact on cybersecurity and, and mitigating cyber risk. Excellent. Um, just give, give us sort of the, the quick rundown. Uh, you talked to me a little bit about the idea of you know building yeah. those business partnerships being critical. Yeah, I think you know one of the things that I've learned over the last few decades in internal audit is that Internal audit can have a much bigger impact if we partner with the business and work with them to try and be proactive and identify at risk, work with them to really understand what are the practical solutions we can do things and, and work with them to help those things get done rather than stand on the sidelines and kind of toss stones, quite honestly. Yeah, and key to that is understanding risk yes, for your organization. Yes, absolutely, I mean, absolutely. How, do you, how, how does one really grasp that from an internal audit perspective? I think internal audit has a very important role, obviously, right? We're, we're objective, independent view, but that perspective adds value to the people who are in the battle every day. So working mm -hmm. with the CISO and the other people in those teams and those say, hey, what do you think the risks are? What do you say, well, what about this? What about this? And bring that independent, that diverse opinion, if you will, from the audit perspective, having people in our teams that know enough to, to actually carry on an intelligent conversation about those risks and understand, say, well, I was reading this article, or I thought about this, or I saw this blog. What do you think about that? Engaging with them and where they're at, and meeting them where they are, and then working with them to get to where they want to be. I think we're aligned on where we want things to be. We don't always align on how to get there, and working with them, usually I found we find a better solution. So how important is it for one, the organization to actually have a strong cybersecurity strategy, and two, for a journal audit to, to be involved in that? I think, given the world we're in today, as we look back, um, you know, the, I in the in the poll survey they did last year, top risks, all cyber risk and, and IT risks. Okay, so we as a profession know this is a big deal. It's our top area. Um, we struggle sometimes to have the right resources to put on it to, to do it right way, which is a challenge that we deal with. We struggle with how to balance all of the expectations of compliance and other things we've got to do that are I have to do's. Is this a want to do or a nice to do? And I think it's a have to do too, is how do I find the right balance? How do I bring it in? And how do I do it in an efficient way so that I can do more with less of your source? And you also talk about you, we can no longer afford to be defensive on this. We have to be right. proactive. Right, absolutely. I think <clears throat> if if the the ransomware and other things that we've seen over the last couple of years haven't taught us that defense doesn't work very well on this one, you know, we really need to be thinking proactively, not just wait and see what happens. Um, we need to be thinking about scenarios and how we play those. We need to be looking and really understanding. And you said it, it's what's my strategy. I've, I've worked with some really, really good information security people over my career, and one of them explained to me one day, it's like, you know, our approach right now is we buy different tools and we apply them. They said, we have this collage hmm. of controls. He said, the problem is there's gaps between them. We haven't taken a strategic look, say, these are the risks I'm trying to mitigate. These are the ways I want to do it. And and have a roadmap to get there over time, because to do it in a big bang is usually cost prohibitive for organizations. I want to do this, and that provides the foundation for this next element and then this next one. And oftentimes, by the time you get three steps in, there's new technology that helps to do it more effective or more efficiently than we've done it anyway. But you need to do it really in a mindful, thoughtful way because just playing patches is like playing whack-a-mole. You just never get it done. Right. And you and I were talking earlier about the importance of internal audits involvement early on where it actually can make an influence. Right, right. So, yeah, that's that was a fun conversation. So. To me, and, and I've been around for a long time, and, and, and I've made a lot of mistakes, quite honestly, right? But when, when we get involved, and the audit gets involved early, you have a chance to have a much bigger impact on, on things. You can design the controls in. You can leverage technology to automate controls that have lower cost to operate, lower mm -hmm. cost to audit and verify, lower failure rates, all those positive things. When we wait to the end and say, oh wait, we need to control here, here, and here, and we have to bolt them on because it's too late to go back and design them in. They're, they're prone to failure, they're expensive to do, you know, people forget, because we're people, right? 
Automation is really the way to make those things happen. And that has to be done early on, not at the end game. So obviously lots to talk about. We're looking forward oh, to it. It's to, gonna be a blast. It is gonna be a blast. Looking All forward right, to man. it. You bet. Thanks. Take care. If you're enjoying this podcast on or before October 27th, there's still time to register for the Cybersecurity Virtual Conference. For more info on that, visit the IIA.org and choose Learning, then navigate to Conferences. And now for a bit of challenging fun with a segment we call In Focus. The IIA has affiliates all around the world, which operate under the full scope of the IIA standards and enjoy access to a wide range of professional guidance, tools, resources, and deliver training for internal auditors in their area. The IIA's four newest affiliates are alphabetically Bolivia, Honduras, Senegal, and Vietnam. Today's challenge, list those affiliates in the order of distance closest to farthest from the IIA Global Headquarters in Lake Mary, Florida. No Googling. We'll reveal the answer after the next segment. Washington, D.C. hosted the recent Financial Services Exchange Conference, which delivered an abundance of insight on what the regulatory landscape of the future may look like and how to prepare for it. Hundreds of internal auditors, from frontline auditors to managers, directors, and CAEs, attended presentations from policymakers, regulators, and thought leaders, such as Stacey Schabel of Jackson Financial Inc., who shared a follow-up on the event and her presentation with Robert Perez. Hey, Stacey, thanks for joining me today to talk a little bit about your presentation at the Financial Services Exchange earlier this year. Uh, but before we go there, I did want to ask you, uh, you, you attend a lot of these conferences, and I wanted to, to get your take on, on, the, on the key takeaways from, from FSE this year. I think the number one takeaway from FSE this year is the ability to engage in person with many of my colleagues um, on real key topics that are affecting our industry. I think ESG and cyber risk are two that, that come to mind and really getting those tools and techniques that'll help us be able to audit more efficiently and effectively. And bonus is that we also got to log in virtually a number of our colleagues. So they didn't have to miss the fun, even if they couldn't attend. Yeah, and obviously I've heard a lot of great things about your presentation at FSC with, with your colleague, Dr. Padbad Lamani. Uh, in your session, you focused on developing strategies for real-time assurance. Uh, leveraging automation and specifically uh, artificial intelligence. Uh, you began that presentation with by setting a foundation of, of the value of real-time assurance. Talk, talk to me a little bit about that. Yeah, so traditional risk-based audits are focused on testing things that happened in the past mm -hmm. to provide a view into what might happen in the future. Um, and then many audit teams, including ours, provide insight. So they provide information on real-time activities um, using continuous auditing or other tools and techniques. Um, with real-time assurance, really the focus is on providing foresight, really looking at and mitigating those risks that could occur in the future versus things that are already in place today. So the key here is to set up internal audit's ability to support management through foresight in, in being able to identify risks uh, that are introduced by emerging technologies. Yeah, so um, by bringing our risk and control expertise and industry knowledge to the table real time, we can help mitigate risks with appropriate controls as that new technology, including AI, is being rolled out. This not only saves the organization time, um, but significantly lessens the risk of errors, especially as new things are being implemented. And it also helps showcase internal audits value, keeping us at the table and really engaged in that strategic change at our companies. Excellent. And you addressed sort of four phases for designing controls to managing those emerging technologies. Can you explain those for me? 
Yeah. So when you're performing real-time assurance, one of the things you really have to keep in mind is that the control environment isn't going to be in the end state. So as you're providing that real-time assurance, um, a lot of times we'll provide that assurance over multiple quarters. And, you know, that first phase is really looking at emerging controls and really helping the organization understand what's happening in the industry and what other companies are doing to mitigate the risk associated with these new technologies. And then thinking about what your company does today and where some of those major control gaps might be. You also might introduce some prototype controls in that, that first stage. Um, and then the second phase is really designing those controls. So management is designing those controls. They're assessing the, and then we would go in and assess the effectiveness of those controls real time. Um, and then we'll continue to iteratively assess the controls as they are more solidified over time throughout the implementation process. So that's the first two phases. The third phase is really forming those controls. So getting those controls in the place where it, they need to be in order to move to the end state, right? Where your implementation of the technology is, you know, business as usual. And we can provide a lot of value there in making sure that this new technology doesn't move into business as usual until we've agreed that the control environment is such that it can support mitigation of those key risks. And so really adding that additional layer of assurance to the business teams. And so when we provide real-time assurance, we provide it over those first three phases. And then the fourth phase is really moving those controls into an operational um, perspective, right? So they're operating in the business as business as usual. And when they're, you know, once they're operating over a period of time, you would then switch from, from providing real-time assurance over that area to, you know, utilizing a more traditional audit approach, right? So you look at what's happened, you provide that backward look around how the controls have operated over time. So the key here is to set up internal audit's ability to support management through foresight in, in being able to identify risks uh, that are introduced by emerging technologies. Yeah, so um, from an audit perspective, the best thing we can do is prepare ourselves and our teams. And some of that is really key in that industry engagement, right? So at things like FSC and other conferences where you're engaging with others in the industry who are doing these innovative things and understanding what others are doing and what kind of controls they're putting in place to mitigate their own risks. And then what we do from an audit perspective is we also take a view on, you know, you know, agnostic of what the organization is putting in place, we take a view on what would good look like, right? And we do that from our industry engagement and engagement with other third parties, et cetera. And we even go as far as saying that these types of artifacts would be valuable as we come look at this technology in the future. And then we'll give that to the business. Um, it's not a, you know, one for one, they then go implement it, right? It's more conceptual what we provide. And then they're in charge of implementing it in the way that makes sense for the company. The second thing is stakeholder alignment. So you really want um, to be aligned with your stakeholders on what you're doing and the value that you're providing. So it isn't a traditional audit. And you need to make sure that they understand that and the value um, that you're providing. The other thing you can do to prepare is identify your company's existing controls that might relate to this new technology. So you might have policies or procedures or other things that are out there. Um, for instance, you know, related to AI, you could think about model risk or any kind of user developed application policies that you already have in place or things around data governance. And how are those already dictating 
dictating some controls that you should be putting in place around this new technology. And from an audit team, we can add a lot of value by identifying those things for the organization, for those in the organization implementing those new technologies. Um, and so then they they don't have to do that themselves. So understanding um, data and IA risks is critical here, right? Yes, definitely understanding your own company's data and AI risks. And also, you know, just being well versed, right? Have done your homework, engaged with external experts if you needed, you know, getting some SME assistance or making sure your team is educated in these new technologies and risks for the company. Because AI, for example, brings unique risks, right? So, um, you know, design risk, for example, you could, in the different design of that type of technology, you could introduce kind of inherent biases in your model based on your training data and other things that you're using. You know, there's risks of, you know, if you put you, um, bad data into AI, you're going to get bad data and results out, right? And given the way that AI works, it might be a little harder to figure out whether your output is good or bad. Um, and so you really need to focus on your inputs and making sure your inputs are good. And then, you know, that follows along to those risks with the algorithm that the AI uses and thinking about how do you test that? How do you over time as an organization make sure your model's continuing to do what it should do? Um, and then, you know, there's also things like performance risks and another risks that come into play, but making sure you understand what are the risks associated with AI and how do they relate to your organization is really important. So you, you introduced um, participants or, or folks who were in your session to a framework for implementing artificial intelligence for real-time assurance. How, how do you do that? So I think, um, you know, I talked a little bit about some of that already from an audit preparation mm -hmm. Standpoint, right? So you need to make sure that you um, have already thought about the risks, you know, identified what you think good controls might look like, um, all, all of those things, and regularly engage with your stakeholders so that they understand what you're setting out to do. Um, you'll also need to do a risk assessment and you'll need to do that risk assessment every time you're doing a real time assurance project because the risks are going to change, right? Given the different phase of the project that you're in. You'll also need to agree a risk and control matrix um, as you would in a standard audit, right? And set a foundation, including what is your audit objective and what is your focus? What are you actually gonna be testing? Um, and then you'll, you'll need to execute your test plan and provide that regular reporting. You know, and there are some nuances between uh, real-time assurance and traditional audits that I think are really important to keep in mind when you're doing that. Um, your audit focus is different on real-time assurance. You are either going to be looking at project management. So what are those project management controls? Or you're going to be looking at how management has assessed the risks and is implementing a good control environment, or you might be looking at, at both of those. And that's different than a standard audit. And so making sure that you understand and you've thought about and agreed what your audit focus is uh, ahead of time. The second difference is, you know, methodology. Your methodology needs to be flexible. So your audit methodology that, you know, um, thinks about what you what's acceptable from a, from a evidence perspective and other things, um, you know, that that needs to be flexible. It needs to be able to flex and clearly report real time out to management the things that you see so they can implement it real time. And also the evidence that you'll collect is is different, right? It's going to be different evidence as you're thinking about, for instance, a conceptual soundness evaluation um, might be some evidence that you wouldn't typically collect in a, in a standard audit. Um, or you're focusing on assessing the, the project plan and the resourcing plan, which isn't something you typically do when you're focused on processes and controls in a traditional audit as well. So obviously you've successfully implemented uh, 
what we're talking about here in your audit shop. What did you find were the sort of the biggest obstacles to success um, for those that were new to this strategy? Um, I think the biggest roadblock um, to success is understanding that it is still an independent audit of um, a key activity of the organization, but it's being performed in a different way, right? So all those things I was mentioning come into play. There's different evidence that is required. It's not the standard evidence that you would um, submit, right? Or you would gather as part of a a risk-based audit. Um, There's, you know, there's different objectives and scope in the audit. And so really the key to success is engaging with your stakeholders. And when I say your stakeholders, it's definitely the individuals that are being audited, those that are implementing the new technology, but also your executive team. They need to understand why you're doing this type of audit and the real value that it provides. Your board also needs to see and your audit committee needs to see, you know, what you're doing and why you're doing it and how it really is providing that really valuable independent assurance. Stacey, thank you so much for for joining us today, uh, especially as part of our our inaugural uh, All Things Eternal Audit uh, broadcast. So it's great to have you here and thank you again for your time and, and your insights. Well, thank you. It's been a pleasure. Appreciate it. Okay, here's the answer to the InFocus challenge, which was to list the IIA's newest affiliates in order of distance, closest to farthest from our headquarters in Lake Mary, Florida. The closest is IIA Honduras at 1,512 kilometers, then IIA Bolivia at 5,164 kilometers, then IIA Senegal at 7,000 kilometers, and the farthest is IIA Vietnam at 15,246 kilometers kilometers. Of course, regardless of where an affiliate may be located geographically, they enjoy the full support and resources of the IIA headquarters. That's all for this month. Thank you for joining us. Be sure to subscribe, rate, and review. If you'd like to enjoy an extended version of the discussions featured today, visit the IIA.org, where IIA members get access to a longer version of this episode with more information and insights. CPEs and knowledge from the experts. Through November 18th, IIA members can save 25% on all Hot Topic seminars and e-seminars. Now is the perfect time to schedule one or more of these convenient learning offerings designed to meet your needs. Register and save today. Use promotional code IIASEM25 at checkout. That's IIASEM25. Thanks for joining us on the first episode of All Things Internal Audit from the IIA. We'll connect again soon.